it was on Christmas Eve of 1968 that the world got a present that would completely change the way we look at our planet. It was this photo here, you can see in front of you. It was nicknamed the Earth Rise, and it's been described as one of the most influential environmental photographs ever taken. And we used to think that our planet was this huge, almost endless um, uh, planet until we realized that it's just actually this tiny bluish dot floating around our sun, just one star among billions of trillions of other stars. And as we later discovered, also, also equally, uh, uh, an even higher perhaps number of planets uh, floating around. And it's really on this very thin skin that surrounds this little Christmas bubble that we hold everything that is dear to us. Life, and plenty of life, uh, from the colorful clownfish of Australia's coral reefs to the mega mammals of Africa savannas, down to Boris Johnson's gut bacteria. But nowhere else on Earth are there so many species as in the tropical rainforests. And I'm lucky enough to have been born not far from one in Brazil's Atlantic forest. And um, it was there that one of my very first memories played out. I was only about five years old when I saw a beautiful blue morpho butterfly. It was huge, or perhaps I was very tiny, but it flew quickly towards me and then it turned right uh, and disappeared. And I was totally paralyzed. How could something so insanely beautiful exist? And just like a duckling prints on the first animal they see when they are born, so did I fall in love with the nature of my home country, Brazil. So while all the other kids were playing football on the beach and surfing and having fun, I went all by myself, filling my pockets with everything I could find in the forest. Delicate flowers, shells, beetles, seeds. That wasn't a good combination to have in your pocket. But luckily, most of the beetles, well, at least some managed to escape before I got home. I was very happy and I thought the forest was endless and everlasting, but it wasn't. So today, less than 8% of Brazil's Atlantic forest remains, and most of it in small pockets scattered all over a bare landscape of pasture, farming, and concrete. I took this photo you can see here just a few months ago outside Rio de Janeiro, and then a guy was going to pouring gasoline on the rest of the trees that had felled and set in fire on them. So my heart, my heart was really bleeding. And satellite images show that deforestation rates in the region increased by 125% last year. And this isn't unique to Brazil's Atlantic forest. Since 1950, we've lost a quarter of the world's tropical rainforests. So we don't have to be Einstein to figure out that this is no good news for the species that live in those habitats. So scientists like myself and my colleagues here at Q, uh, we are estimating that two in five plant species, so about 140,000 plants, are now threatened to go extinct over the next decades. And the situation is just as bad for animals, I'm afraid. And in total, we are reckoning that about one million species now face extinction because of us. And these problems aren't just in the tropics. The UK has lost almost half of its biodiversity as a result of land change since the Industrial Revolution. And I'm very sorry to bring you this news on a Monday evening, but I'm sure you kind of knew this already. So perhaps the bigger question is, why does this really matter? There are lots of problems out there. We've spent a couple of years obsessed with COVID, and we're now beginning to see what's coming out of that in terms of the rise of living costs, inflation. But in the long term, Climate change will be an even bigger issue, which is already being started to fail um, by each one of us and some people more than others. And I'm sorry to say that climate change is not the biggest tsunami underway. It is the loss of nature and its associated biodiversity. If we drastically reduce emissions and draw down carbon out of the atmosphere, we can mitigate climate change and hopefully reach a more stable climate. But a species that goes extinct never comes back. And with it goes all the stuff that species give us all the time for free. Food, medicine, beauty materials, fibers, beauty, and so much more. If you just stop and try to think for a moment, how many species have you used today? For breakfast, your lunch, 
in your clothes, in the furniture around you? Probably very many. But is biodiversity the same thing as species? Not really. It's actually much more than that. So in my book, I use examples from my scientific expeditions around the world to explain that biodiversity is a star. Just like climate is more than just temperature. It's also rainfall, it's the seasons, extreme weather, and so forth. And biodiversity is the variety of all life, from the genes all the way through to species, the evolutionary history that species represent, the ecological functions in nature, and the many ecosystems that make this such a beautiful and amazing planet, from the Scottish Highlands to the rainforest of Borneo. And another cool thing about biodiversity is that it's not really what most people think it is. I have no idea what you think when I say the word biodiversity, what comes to your mind? But the odds are that you may imagine some nice birds perhaps, or mammals, or pretty flowers in front of you. But most species on the planet are really, really small. And some people would say that they're very, very ugly as well. But of course, they're totally wrong on that. And you can see this in this image, where different groups of species are drawn in proportion to the number of species they represent. So the beetle here on the top, um, that's huge because there are millions of insects. And the same with mites. And the big mammals from the savanna that you perhaps thought about when I said the word biodiversity, they were represented by just that tiny little elephant uh, in the shade of a mushroom. Now, you could think that just because we've got people like Darwin and Linnaeus and places filled with all sorts of interesting species like the Natural History Museum or Kew, that we would already know how many species there are on Earth. But we know as little about how many species we share our planet with as we do about how many stars there are in the outer universe. This is why biodiversity is our hidden universe on planet Earth. I'll give you an example. I, a few years ago, my PhD student, Camila, she traveled around all across the Amazon taking small samples of soil. So when she came back to my lab, she worked, worked together with her to extract all the DNA in those uh, soil samples to count how many species we could detect in each one of those. So try to guess how many species we could find in the equivalent of a single teaspoon of soil. 10, 50, 100? We couldn't believe when we found that 1,800 species were represented in a single sample in the Amazon, which is almost as many species of plants that we have in the whole of the United Kingdom. And most of those species were unknown to science, including most of the 400 different species of fungi that was contained in a single spoon. So the mushroom in this image here could actually be much, much larger than it's shown. But of course, we'll never be able to identify and study all those species if they go extinct. And this is why we must bend the curve on biodiversity loss. So how do we do that? In this way. And this is the most important image in my talk today and in my book as well, because it's how we're going to fix the problem. And it represents a great amount of science underneath as well. So the black curve here shows how much biodiversity we're losing. So to stop that, the first thing we've got to do is to conserve what we have left and to restore what we've degraded. We then must tackle climate change, which contributes to the threat of many species. We need to reduce other drivers like pollution and the spread of invasive species and diseases. And to really turn this curve upwards, we need companies to make more sustainable products, and each of us also needs to consume less. Everyone and every part of our societies, from the governments to our schools, you and I, we need to be part of this. And the good news is that we can make a difference, a real difference, and we can see positive results almost immediately. I've packed the book with lots of tips and tricks that I hope you'll find and very useful in a big research. And we're all different. So I think we need to think how each one of us can best contribute. So for instance, my wife and I, we worked really hard um, to increase the biodiversity in our own garden in Sweden, which is quite tiny actually. Uh, but to the extent that the largest garden magazine in the country came to photograph it, which was quite a thing. And in the title of the um, news, for those of you who are not yet fluent in Swedish, they quote me saying, think more about biodiversity and less about your neighbors. And I never really understood why our neighbors stopped talking to us after that. We also decided to put nearly 
all of our family savings to buy a patch of rainforest in Brazil for permanent protection and to support the studies of scientists and young people. We were left with only 200 pounds in our account after that, but we're happy to have done it. And all the money that I get from the sales of this book is also going to the same purpose. So even though the threats to biodiversity are so big, I am actually optimistic. And science tells us that there is still a narrow window of opportunity left for us to make peace with nature. So I hope that this book will give you new insights into biodiversity, including lots of things you probably had no idea about, I can promise you, and that you'll then want to join us in helping to protect life on this little blue planet floating around in the universe. Thank you.